good that already a lot of people know each other, uh, Kim. <laughs> good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests. On behalf of the Advisory Council on International Affairs, I would like to warmly welcome you to the third AIV Wellenstein Lecture. And it's a great pleasure to see all of you, even though it's under very bleak and worrisome international circumstances, as I would like to stress from the outset. The Wellenstein uh, Lecture, a biannual public event organized by our Advisory Council about current topics of international affairs, hopefully provides an appropriate opportunity to reflect on these great circumstances in a serious manner. Just to make sure, the, letter, the lecture is named after the Dr. Edmund Mom Wellenstein. During his lifetime, Mr. Wellenstein was an honorary member of the AIV and one of the co-founders of our European institutions. Mr. Wellenstein played an important role in the Dutch resistance during the Second World War and was imprisoned in the concentration camp Amersfoort 70 years later. In 2013, he published a very personal account about his experiences in the camp entitled Numbers Have a Soul, Numbers the Inziel Hebbe, a title that rings true as much in today's world as it did in the past. As we, complicate, as we contemplate today the numbers and casualties in places like Israel, Lebanon and Gaza, over 40,000 casualties during the last year alone, in Sudan, close to 20,000 since a brutal conflict there broke out in April 2023, and of course closer by the staggering amount of casualties falling in the Ukraine war. Mom Wellenstein was a principled man, an intellectual in action, who combined realistic, pragmatic analysis with a sharp moral compass, appropriate action and strategic direction. Thus, an example to all of us in our work in a fractured and broken world. I'm therefore very pleased to acknowledge a number of Mom Wellenstein's relatives in the audience today. It's a great honor to have you among us. The first Wellenstein lecture was delivered in February 2020 and dealt with the European challenges and the urgent need for our country to redefine its international policy in a Europe, in a world where large power shifts directly challenge the traditional Dutch adag adagium of peace, profits and principles, so eloquently described by our former AIV member and Minister of Defence, Joris Voorhoeven. The second lecture, entitled Universal Human Rights in a Changing Global Order, was held in the fall of 2022 by the Honorary Professor Gareth Evans, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Australia. His lecture showed us that international law and norms are not outdated in a world where might seems right. But if I may paraphrase him in present context to the contrary, they are to be strongly defended without naivete as a first and foremost geopolitical necessity. And we reside in a city that obliges us to do so. The lessons learned from both these lectures apply directly to the complex situation in the Middle East. Along the same lines as the previous two speakers, our distinguished speaker today, Mrs. Kim Gattas, will address a topic of acute international relevance at the moment, namely the current crisis in the Middle East. Mrs. Gattas, we are delighted and honored uh, to welcome you here today. Before I will say a few more words as we discussed about our own report coming up on this issue, I would like to say already now that Ms. Gattas made an enormous effort to be here with us. Uh, her family is in Lebanon, and I'm sure she plans to be back as soon as she can. Mrs. Gattas traveled all the way from Beirut on Friday, which, as you will imagine, was an extremely challenging journey. So please give her already now a very warm welcome. Let, let me just uh, say uh, two words about the subject of today's lecture, reimagining the West and the rest in the shadow of Gaza in the context of our work as Advisory Council as we seek Mrs. Gatta's advice. The Middle East today, it's almost a cliché, stands again at a critical juncture, facing profound challenges that have far-reaching implications for regional stability and global peace, but I think also for our European strategic interests and political, international and moral standing. 
The situation in Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, and Lebanon is emblematic of a number of very complex overlapping crises. But the enormous escalation of violence has not only resulted in devastating and enormous human suffering, it also highlighted again deep-rooted historical and political grievances and traumas that remain unresolved and may lead to further distrust and radicalization and a deep felt sense of isolation and insecurity among all the peoples involved. This impressed strongly on me personally when I was recently in a very moving and impressive meeting taking place in Geneva with families of those massacred in the kibbutzim on October the 7th together, and I stress together with admiration and great humility, with families of those many killed by the massive bombardments in Gaza. It was a very direct and personal meeting, full of anger and loss. But to our great astonishment, as mediation bystanders, also one of real and even detailed and very realistic conversations and proposals on next concrete steps for what everybody hoped would be soon a day after. The group is still every day working on every concrete proposals for humanitarian access, security, state building, guarantees, and engaged to build bridges in their own polarized communities, even as the day after, and even the ceasefire seems fading away into what seems a distant future. All participants, and they were coming from very different political persuasions and identities, including members of the security establishment, private sector, civil society, and different political views, they were not like-minded, they all fully realized that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, now in its seventh decade, remains a crucial part of a larger region's instability to be tackled immediately and without naivete. The continued occupation and rising extremism, unequal power positions of the parties, combined with the lack of any success in getting to guaranteed security and sovereignty for all peoples involved, festers on year in, year out, and leads into a further abyss that was very clear to the testimonies uh, the key of their discussions held. As we know in the West Bank, in the meantime, tensions are escalating and Israeli military operations continue alongside staggering growth of illegal settlements. The Palestinian Authority has lost credibility and is seen as corrupt and authoritarian by many. The two-state solution, still in our view crucial, an indispensable goal and long proposed as a path to peace, seems to most in these meetings as a mantra more distant than ever as both sides become further entrenched in positions of fear, mistrust and radicalization. The international community has long sought to broker peace between Israel and the Palestinians, but meaningful progress has remained elusive, partly because of neglect, an unwillingness to enforce and guarantee, a failure to prioritize and use the pressure of the mix of our large set of instruments available, including by the European Union, but also by many Arab states among uh, other nations. And this has now come back to haunt them, first of all, and us, like a boomerang. So new efforts with new language for a serious two-state solution is urgently required and requires our advice. Finally, at last but not least, Lebanon. I will not say much about it. Kim just comes from there. Already grappling with a severe economic collapse, a state in the state called Hezbollah, political paralysis and social unrest, has now been drawn further into the Israeli-Gaza conflict. A last-minute call of the United States and France to come to a ceasefire has been discarded by Prime Minister Netanyahu and home to millions of refugees, including many Palestinians and Syrians. Any further destabilization of the country could trigger a further humanitarian disaster and might lead to a broader regional conflict. Nobody, as of now, knows if deterrence works. We will see. In this context, we should also keep in mind the clear lessons of 1982 and 2006. Escalation and tactics cannot replace de-escalation and strategy. Nor can the rest of the world be they at the UN, in New York, Washington or in the region, just stand powerlessly by for others to make that choice. Here we definitely seek your advice. The situation in Israel, the Palestinian territories and Lebanon plays clearly into wider political tensions in the Middle East. We see that every day, opening our papers. 
were competing regional powers, Iran first of all, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, are vying for influence. Big powers around the world watch and they hedge their positions. Iran's continued support for groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, as well as its broader ambitions in the region, have heightened tensions with Israel and the Gulf. These dynamics contribute to an ongoing shadow war between Israel and Iran, with proxy battles playing out across the region. From Syria, we shouldn't forget Syria, to Yemen. They are also dividing states in Europe, the West in general, and across the globe and in our public opinions. Given the importance and urgency of the situation in the Middle East, the AIV has felt the need to contemplate an updated advice on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Recognizing neglect of the conflict and focusing on national and European responsibilities to help catalyze a ceasefire and support ways to come to a more sustainable solution. Without illusions, but with clarity. A divided Europe plays no serious role, although large European security, political, economic and humanitarian interests are at stake. And each country, including our own, carries its own responsibility. The abdication of Europe, I think, is an issue. The main player being the United States. It's important to realize that this afternoon, I think at five o'clock, finally the foreign minister is going to have a phone call on this. The question is to what extent are they rising to the occasion and think through what the situation of today means also for this continent. We could fortunately build on the previous advisory report. I want to thank Mr. Van Staden, who is here, who was responsible, I think, for the last report we made on this in 2013. And what struck me when I read it, and it was at the request of the Senate at the time, many of the recommendations of 2013, which is unfortunate and fortunate at the, at the same time, were not followed through whatsoever. Yes, the geopolitics have changed, but not the controversies around the world and in our societies. Good advice is needed based on lived experience of reality and enormous expertise. Simplification and abstentionism are no options. Today, almost one year after the October 7th attack by Hamas on Israel, we will hear from Mrs. Gattas how she assesses the impact of the Gaza war on the region and the geopolitical fractures it has revealed and amplified. In doing so, she will also explore the prospects for a way forward, hopefully, although I know it's difficult. I'm sure that for many of you, uh, Kim Gattas doesn't need any introduction, but it's my task still to briefly summarize her background and accomplishment, and I'm getting out of that one. Kim Gattas is an author and analyst with more than 20 years of experience in print, in broadcast media, in analysis, covering the Middle East, international affairs, and US foreign policy. It would make me very tired if you had to do that every day. Can you imagine what happens every day? She is a distinguished fellow at Columbia University's Institute for Global Politics. Ms. Gattas is also a contributing writer for The Atlantic magazine and contributing editor for The Financial Times. And she previously reported for the BBC and also our own Volkskrant. She's the author of a great book, which maybe many of you have read, Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the 40 years rivalry that unraveled culture, religion, and collective memory in the Middle East. A New York Times notable book of 2020, and I saw it's also translated in Dutch, in a beautiful format, by the way. And you wrote, which I think is very interesting for those who read it on a different topic, but related, the secretary, a journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the heart of American power. <laughs> also in Dutch, all right. I, is it on sale here somewhere? We'll have to check. She serves on the board of trustees of the American University of Beirut, the board of directors of the Global Center for Pluralism and the Advisory Council of the Atlas of Impunity. Born and raised in Beirut during the Civil War. Before I give the floor to Mrs. Gattas, I would like to say that we are fully aware that the subject of today's lecture is delicate and politically charged, also in our own societies, and that understandably many people feel emotionally affected by it. I think we all are. However, I hope that we will be able to have a constructive, respectful gathering today. I'm sure of that. And after the lecture, uh, there will be ample opportunity for Q&A, and I would like to invite those of you who would like to ask questions to save them for that part of the, the event. <coughs> Mrs. Gattas, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. You have the floor. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for being here. It's a, it's a full house. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, colleagues, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. Um, again, thank you for being here. It has been a challenge um, arriving to the Netherlands. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bert, for your uh, generous introduction, for your welcome. Thank you to your team as well uh, for inviting me for this, um, this lecture. I'm really honored to be here and to be speaking to you. And thank you for all the support that you have given me over the last few uh, days as I made my way to the Netherlands and made the difficult decision about whether to actually travel or, or not. When the Advisory Council on Foreign Affairs first contacted me to give the lecture, it was in June. And the landscape looked rather different. President Joe Biden had just given a hopeful speech to launch his initiative for peace in the Middle East. He was laying out his vision that involved not only a ceasefire and the release of Israeli hostages, but also a path towards a two-state solution, normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and of course, calm on the border between Lebanon and Israel. He tried at the time to appeal to the Israeli public with a vision of what life in the region could look like for them outside of the dark tunnel that they have found themselves in since the atrocities committed by Hamas on October the 7th. President Biden told Israelis, I ask you to take a step back and think what will happen if this moment, this moment of opportunity, of peace, of normalization, if this moment is lost. We cannot lose this moment, he said. Indefinite war in the pursuit of an unidentified notion of total victory will only bog down Israel in Gaza. The Saudis were eager to normalize with Israel, even months into the war in Gaza. Those discussions were still being held with the White House. Before October 7th, the deal was actually within reach, and it was going to be called the Jerusalem Jeddah Declaration. And it was going to involve a small concession or small concessions to the Palestinians, well below their aspirations to an actual state. But progress was being made towards that declaration. But as much as Saudi Arabia wants a defense pact with the US to protect itself against Iran, Riyadh knew that it had to up the price of normalization with Israel after October the 7th. Small concessions would no longer be enough. The kingdom insisted there now had to be a clear, irreversible path to a two-state solution as part of its normalization with Israel. In exchange for what was in fact still in effect a vague promise of a Palestinian state in the future, Israel would get peace with a custodian of the two holy sites of Islam, and by extension, with most of the Arab and Muslim world. And what better way to guarantee Israel's peace and security? So when I accepted this invitation, I was hopeful that there would be something positive to discuss and describe. And it is on this basis that we drafted the summary for the lecture and the invitation that you all received. I am by nature a hopeful person. You don't survive 15 years of civil war in Lebanon without being hopeful. I believe in solutions. I believe in creative diplomacy. And I continue to insist on believing in the goodness of human nature, even though it appears that we live in a world where might makes right. So that was in early June. And that moment that Biden, that Biden described now appears to have been lost. As Lenin famously said, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. In the weeks since I, accept, since I accepted this invitation, decades did happen. And to be precise, I would say four decades 
and I will explain in a moment why I say four decades. I had to rewrite my, my lecture several times, not because this is a news summary, but the point here is to provide the most accurate assessment of where we are and where we might be going. Can we really talk about the day after in Gaza, when we might be at the start of a long war in Lebanon? What is left of Gaza? What will be left of Lebanon after all this? You know, this is something that Arab officials that I've spoken to throughout this have told me again and again. The, the Americans keep wanting to talk to us about the day after, and we keep telling them, when is that day and what will be left? What exactly are we talking about? Now, in parallel with the devastation in Gaza and the rising humanitarian um, uh, human death toll uh, and humanitarian crisis, for the last 11 months, Israel and Hezbollah have also been engaged in daily border clashes in southern Lebanon on the border with Israel. It started when Hezbollah launched the first rockets against Israel on October the 8th to, in their words, support Hamas and the Palestinian cause. They wanted to keep the Israeli army busy on its northern border. They thought that this would deter the Israeli army in some ways or keep it too busy that it could not enter militarily into Gaza. This is a war that no one in Lebanon voted for. Lebanon is a country with no president, a caretaker government, barely functioning institutions, a collapsed economy, and it is home to one million, if not more, Syrian refugees in a country of five million. That's 20, 25% of the population. This is a country in which Hezbollah has veto power on the politics, a country in which it has killed its political opponents, starting with leftists in the 1980s. I speak about that a little bit in my book, in my book Black Wave, and continuing with the assassination of the former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri in 2005, and several others, many of them friends of mine. Hezbollah also has Syrian blood on its hands. It was heavily involved in the Syrian civil war, propping up Bashar al-Assad, that bothersome war that no one in Europe or in the US really wanted to hear about, that no one really cared about, except when Syrian refugees showed up on Europe's border. That war, which some Western officials thought they could let Russia take care of, Vladimir Putin learned many lessons from that war. And as much as you try to build fortress Europe, you cannot keep these problems from coming back to haunt you. Like you said, Bert, it's the boomerang effect, unless you address them in a systemic and fair way. And I will return to this briefly later. But back to Gaza, as I said, for 11 months and up, up until last week, the balance of deterrence on the Lebanon-Israel border held somewhat. Iran and Hezbollah signaled repeatedly and clearly that they did not want to escalate and start an all-out war. All signs and intelligence reports indicate they were not informed in advance about the Hamas operation of October 7th. They, there may have been a general understanding, yes, you go and carry out some operations as you have done against the Israelis, but there was no clear advance warning of the extent of that operation. And the first ever phone call between the Iranian president and the Saudi crown prince took place a week after the Hamas operation, and it was a clear indication that the Iranians were looking for an off-ramp. They were worried about being dragged into this, and they wanted no part of it. Tehran is concerned, first and foremost, about the survival of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the regime. And for years, it has set up a forward defense basis strategy where it keeps its enemies, Israel and America, busy, far away from Iran's own borders by setting up militias in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. We need to remember how traumatizing the Iran-Iraq the, the Iran war was for Iran. Eight years during which no one stood with Iran, sent billions of dollars of weapons to Iraq, thousands of Iranians died, died while, as I said, the world stood by um, Iraq, the US and, and the, Saudi, the Saudis and the Kuwaitis. The Islamic Republic of Iran 
promised itself it would never find itself in this position again. Hence, Hezbollah. The jewel in the crown of this strategy, keeping Iran's enemies busy. Iran and Hezbollah assess that for the sake of upholding what they call the axis of resistance against Israel, and their long-standing claim that they are the true defenders of the Palestinian cause, that they could show limited support for Hamas in a controlled war of attrition on the border between Lebanon and Israel without escalating to a full war. Earlier this year, Israel started killing Hamas leaders in Beirut and then in Tehran and repeatedly assassinated Hezbollah commanders in Lebanon. Yet the Iranian and Hezbollah response remained restrained, telegraphed, and choreographed. Yes, 80,000 Israelis were displaced from northern Israel. 80,000 Lebanese were also displaced from southern Lebanon. But considering that Hezbollah has an estimated 150,000 missiles, including thousands of precision-guided missiles, the amount of fire that Hezbollah unleashed on Israel was limited. 80% of the ammunition fired across that border was Israeli into Lebanon. And even the missiles, that, missiles and drones that Iran sent to attack Israel in April was clearly a telegraphed show well in advance. Um, and it provoked a lot of jokes in um, the Middle East about you know, how Israel pretends, uh, how Iran pretends that it is responding to something when it in fact it isn't. And it's making sure the Americans and the Israelis know precisely what they're about to do so that the Iron Dome and Israel can intercept the missiles. Hezbollah insisted it would only stop firing onto Israel when there would be a ceasefire in Gaza. History had shown that so far, all the wars between Hamas and Israel, and there are about 15 of them, last a couple of months at most. Hezbollah and its patron in Tehran believed they could keep up the pressure, even as the war in Gaza dragged for three, four, seven, ten months, Hezbollah kept insisting it would continue to target northern Israel until there was a ceasefire in Gaza. Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, could not renege on his words. You may not like them, you may disagree with them, but you have to understand their thinking and their strategy. He has a base to answer to. He has stakeholders to answer to. And from my understanding, from conversations I had with politicians in Lebanon and European diplomats, Nasrallah was actually hoping that by continuing to launch rockets on northern Israel, he would be able to push the Biden administration to pressure Netanyahu into a hostage deal so that at the same time, Israel would also recover calm on its northern border. Iran and Hezbollah assessed that Israel did not want a big war. And that is an assessment that turned out to be a mistake. And it would be a fatal mistake for the group and for its leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Israel had made a very different assessment. It saw that Iran was not responding with real fire and fury when Hamas and Hezbollah leaders were assassinated in Lebanon and in Tehran. And that demonstrated the extent to which Iran was trying not to be dragged into this conflict. So Israel pushed the limits again and again, further and further. I call that Middle East roulette. At some point, you go too far. And 10 days ago, everything changed. Prime Minister Netanyahu was now a year into a war in Gaza with no clear victory in sight, eager to prolong the conflict until at, least, until at least after the US elections. And so Israel shifted gears. It started last week, Tuesday. I'm trying to, I've lost track of time. We're Monday. It, lasted, it started two weeks ago uh, on, on a Tuesday with a pager and walkie-talkie explosions in Lebanon, an operation which had probably been in motion for over two years already because of everything that was involved in preparing this and sending these pages to Lebanon. So well before Gaza. This operation sowed chaos inside Hezbollah, the organization, but it also terrorized the Lebanese everywhere. 
Sirens were wailing for hours. Hospitals were overwhelmed in all parts of the country, Christian and Muslim. People got rid of their phones. Mothers unplugged their baby monitors. But it also made the Hezbollah network light up like a Christmas tree. Suddenly, Israel could see where these pagers were, who the injured were, who visited them, where they were, where they went, and who they met with. One of the dead was the son of Ali Ammar, a Hezbollah member of parliament. So his son died. Ali Ammar himself then died on Friday in the Israeli strike that killed Hassan Nasrallah. So I assume that was part of the tracking. I know that there is a measure of awe in some circles for what Israel has done over the last two weeks. From a purely tactical point of view, from a cold military perspective, yes, this was a well-developed strategy, years in the making, 18 years, in fact, since 2006, the last war between Hezbollah and Israel, which in essence Israel lost simply because it did not win and which Hezbollah won simply because it did not lose. It was still standing, even though Israel had promised to destroy Hezbollah at the time. And Israel's strategy now appears clear. For 11 months, they observed Hezbollah. They tracked their movements, on top of all the tracking they'd done for the last 18 years. And so they decapitated the organization, they destroyed their means of communications, they sowed chaos within the rank and file, and then they doubled down on further strikes to try to make Hezbollah capitulate and take down every single member of the organization. They call it escalate to de-escalate, bombing your way to peace. An Israeli diplomat uh, tweeted at me on, on, uh, on, on X uh, to say there's, a, there's another um, uh, 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 sentence that we use to d describe how crazy this is, but I think it's, it can't be repeated in polite company. So if you follow me on Twitter, um, you, can, you can find it. And somebody also said, well, you know, the Allies did that in World War II, right? They bombed their way to peace. The key difference here is that aside from the fact that the wide-scale damage and bombing of civilians in World War II are what led to the revision and expansion of the Geneva Conventions and upgrading of international humanitarian law, is that the Allies then helped rebuild Japan and Germany. The Marshall Plan, I'm sure you all remember that. They didn't try to occupy parts of these countries or annex them. And they also said, never again. Many Lebanese oppose Hezbollah. I would say a small majority, maybe a large majority. And as I said earlier, many Lebanese paid with their lives trying to push back against them. There are those many of them too, who support Hezbollah as a resistance movement against Israel, which occupied Lebanon for 18 years until 2000, and continues to occupy the West Bank and to control Gaza. There are those in the Shia community in Lebanon who are true believers, who fully adhere to the group, who see Hezbollah as the protector of the Shia community in a country where the state historically has done little to protect or help them. And they are particularly concerned now to realize that they've lost their defender and that they might be on their own because it appears that Iran is not coming to help them. That Iran, in fact, fights Israel by offering up the bodies of Arab men and women as martyrs. That Bashar al-Assad, who survived thanks to Hezbollah and the thousands of Hezbollah fighters who, or the hundreds, I should say, of Hezbollah fighters who died fighting for him in Syria, to prop up his regime, that Bashar al-Assad himself has very little to say and will not help either. I'd like to you know, point out that the border between Syria and Israel remains you know, fairly calm. Bashar al-Assad issued a statement of condolences for Nasrallah, and if I were to summarize, um, basically he said, thank you for your services, it was nice to know you, goodbye. But let me say this unequivocally, no one no one in Lebanon believes the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu or any Israeli official when they say our fight is with Hezbollah, not with the Lebanese. 
Our enemy is Hezbollah, not Lebanon. You can be relieved that Nasrallah is dead, while still fearing the Israelis and their military campaign. We have all watched what happened in Gaza over the last 11 months, and the Lebanese are terrified that this will now happen to them. Much of South Lebanon has already been leveled. Every week, if not every day, for the last 11 months, I have woken up in Beirut to hear Israeli officials, politicians, ministers, even journalists say that Israel should annihilate Lebanon, that they should bomb Lebanon back to the Stone Age, that they should turn it into Gaza. Just last week, Israel's Minister of Education said it again. There is no difference between Hezbollah and Lebanon. Lebanon will be annihilated. It will cease to exist. Do I look like Hezbollah? I haven't seen a single Western condemnation of such statements. I will be generous and say that perhaps those statements don't make it into the press here or onto your social media algorithms, so you're not aware of them. But they make headlines in Lebanon, and they are in our social media feeds. And for a while, I dismiss them as bravado intimidation words. Not anymore. And I want to urge you to ask yourselves why it is acceptable for Israeli officials to get away with statements like these. There's already an Israeli website advertising settlements in southern Lebanon with models of apartments that would be for sale. I did not know, but apparently southern Lebanon is part of greater Israel. The double standard in expecting us to condemn statements that call for the annihilation of Israel should be applied, should be recognized when then Israeli officials also ask for the annihilation of others. The civilian casualty toll in Lebanon is already immense in just 10 days. In the first day of bombing alone, Monday two weeks ago, 500 people were killed, including dozens of women and children. One million people are already refugees displaced inside Lebanon in a country of four million. The strain on hospitals, communities, security service, the army is beyond description. I almost thought I wouldn't make it to the Netherlands because as things progressively got worse last week, my flight was canceled and all, all airlines canceled their flights to Lebanon as fears grew of an all-out war. I did find a seat on the national carrier, Middle East Airlines, which is still flying. I got on the plane Friday morning because there was talk of a ceasefire. Netanyahu was in New York and knowing how diplomacy usually works from having covered these issues, I thought I had at least a few days while people tried to get to a ceasefire before talks would break down if, if it didn't work out. And that's what French diplomats also told me in Beirut. We're working on a ceasefire. That's what the Biden administration also <coughs> believed. I spoke to a White House official on Wednesday. We are working on a ceasefire, he said. Stay safe while we work through this. By the time I landed in Amsterdam, the strike that killed Nasrallah had, of course, changed everything. Even as Netanyahu was in New York, even as he had indicated that he was considering a ceasefire and then reneging and speaking at the UN, at the UN General Assembly, plans for that strike had been approved. And the word used by European diplomats to tell me how they felt about this strategy was deception deception by the Israeli Prime Minister. But I want to go back in history for a moment, because I believe that today Israel is trying to destroy a problem it created in 1982. In June 1982, Israel began its second invasion of Lebanon, the first one having been in 1978. My family lived on a dangerous crossing on the southeastern side of Beirut, and the Israeli bombardment became so intense, I developed a fever as a five-year-old. My mother took me and one of my sisters in her car, and we drove out of Beirut in the dark to the north. My, mother and, uh, my father and my other sister joined us later. We were privileged. We had a small beach bungalow where we could stay. 
And from a distance, because of the geography of Lebanon, from where we were, we could see Beirut being pummeled by Israeli shelling, really on fire, red all night. The city came under siege for two months. 17,000 people were killed. 30,000 people were injured. We eventually left by bus to Syria, from there onwards to the Netherlands. We stayed here for two months, the summer. Netherlands was a place of refuge for us, for me. It was where the sound of planes in the air was not a threat, where I could play outside without fear of snipers. And I remember crying all the tears in my body when we had to go back at the end of the summer. But my family wanted to go home. No one wants to leave their home. No one wants to be a refugee. And it's a bit ironic that here I am again in the Netherlands as we fear that there's another Israeli invasion um, of Lebanon underway. But I am going on a, getting on a plane tomorrow to go back. But this is not about me. What I'm trying to tell you here is that at the time, the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Defense Minister Ariel Sharon had a plan in mind to remake the Middle East. And they said it. They thought they could invade Lebanon, get rid of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the guerrilla fighters who were there at the time, install a friendly pro-Israel Christian president, and force Lebanon and Syria to sign a peace treaty. Tactically, it worked. The PLO was forced out. Israel's ally, Bashir Jmeil, was elected president. And then it all unraveled. Jmeil was assassinated. And crucially, it was the start of the Iran-Syria axis with Soviet help at the time. So you can see the trend lines that continue even to this day. To thwart America and Israel, two days after Israel invaded, two days, Iran sent 500 revolutionary guards to Lebanon via Syria. This was the beginning of the formation of Hezbollah, the start of the so-called axis of resistance, and an 18-year-long occupation of South Lebanon. It marked the beginning and the rise of, Leb of Hezbollah as an all-powerful political party in Lebanon and the most powerful, heavily armed, non-state actor with a regional role. So tactically, the Israeli invasion worked. The PLO left Lebanon, went to Tunisia, but strategically, it was a disaster. So what problems are we creating today with the current Israeli military campaign? What problems are the US and Europe helping to create, by omission even, by not calling for an immediate ceasefire, by repeating without any caveats that Israel has the right to defend itself, by not upholding international and humanitarian law in Gaza, by not applying leverage, whether American or European, to end this cycle of violence, by not listening to Israeli and Palestinian voices of peace, the ones you met, and there are many of them, but the voices on the extreme sides, on either side, are the ones that are loudest. What problems are we creating by not doing everything in our power to get a ceasefire for Gaza and help the release of the Israeli hostages? Gaza and the Israeli hostages, now overshadowed by what's happening in Lebanon. Don't get me wrong, Lebanon, and its fledgling government and army have a responsibility to step up, to form a coalition of national unity, to call for and respect the implementation of UN resolutions such as Resolution 1701. But this country was barely functioning before the war, and I don't see the Israeli military campaign letting up to provide the space for these discussions internally for the Lebanese government and the opposition to come together. After the assassination of Nasrallah, Netanyahu said, we settled our scores. And I thought that was an indication that they were ready to stand down a little bit. But instead, we're seeing the Israeli military campaign increasing. And even the Israeli opposition calling for an invasion of Lebanon. Has no one learned any lessons? from history. In 1982, the Israeli journalist and peace activist, very well-known author, Amos Oz, wrote, 
we can never atone for what we did in Beirut. It was the first time that Israel entered an Arab capital, the first time it bombarded an Arab city indiscriminately. That war, that invasion, changed Israel. It changed Lebanon, and it changed the Middle East. 42 years later, four decades later, in just a few weeks, here we are again, Israel trying to settle old scores, fighting the last war, and speaking again about plans to remake the Middle East. There is another man I quote often in relation to that period. His name is Malcolm Kerr. You may not have heard of him, but he was the president of the American University of Beirut in the 80s. Kerr's family had a long history in the region alongside American missionaries since the, early, since the 1800s. He'd been born in Beirut. It was home for him. He spoke Arabic. Three of his four children were born in Beirut. He and his wife had met there. She was American, as, she is American as well. And he and his family went back and forth between their home in California, where he taught at UCLA, and Cairo and Beirut, where he taught at the American universities. Malcolm Kerr exemplified what was best about America and the values that it proclaims it stands for. He was deeply wedded to the Palestinian cause. He was extremely critical of American policy in the Middle East and he was a friend of Israel. He had Israeli friends and students. He lectured in Tel Aviv. He was a staunch supporter of peace between Israel and its neighbors, advising various American administrations on peace efforts in the region. It's the kind of complex balancing of positions that seems to elude us today in this deeply polarized world of binary choices. You're either pro this or pro that. No, let's be pro-peace. Malcolm Kerr was killed for his positions. It was the first political assassination of an opponent that Hezbollah had ever carried out in January 1984. Kerr had stayed in Lebanon despite the dangers, the blowing up of the US embassy and the marine barracks bombing in 1983, and then he was assassinated in January 1984. But he always upheld one truth. And he said, and I quote, the truly civilized man is marked by empathy. That today is a radical choice. Empathy, nuance, compromise. It's a choice that I have made, that I hope you will make as well, and that we should make every single day. I know Foreign policy is not based on empathy. I am wise enough to understand, even as a Lebanese, that the calculations going into play now in discussions about what we do next are all about politics, realpolitik, election schedules, coalition issues. But I do hope, despite all of that, that my words today have given you food for thought. History, I think, is an important context for decision making. But empathy would certainly help understand the rift that has been created between the West and the rest over Gaza and Ukraine, and in particular the contrast between how the West dealt with Ukraine and how it dealt with Gaza. I know Israel is the West's ally and Putin is not. Hamas attacked Israel and massacred and kidnapped hundreds of, Israeli October, of Israelis on October 7th. Zelensky did not, President Zelensky did not attack Russia. It was Russia that invaded Ukraine. There are no perfect comparisons and we cannot draw parallels. But hospitals are being targeted in both. Civilians are dying in both. And humanitarian law should be upheld in both. By the way, there wasn't much concern when Putin was bombing hospitals in Syria for years. And that's what really cuts to the heart of the issue. It's not about comparing Gaza and Ukraine. It's about comparing even if you want to reduce it just to that. When, when does Putin get condemned? Not when he does it in Syria, only when he does it in Ukraine. That's why I say again that the concept of Fortress Europe 
or a fortress America provides a false sense of security. This world is too interconnected. What happens in Syria doesn't stay in Syria. It comes back to haunt you in Ukraine. I do think we have something in common with Ukraine, us now in Gaza and in Lebanon, the experience of war, of life in war. It binds you. There is solidarity between us. There is a lot of solidarity, actually, between Ukrainians and Syrians. And I've seen a lot of solidarity from Ukrainians for people in Gaza and for us now in Lebanon. And there is another commonality, the fear of being forgotten by the West, even in Ukraine. President Zelensky, his ministers, Ukrainian journalists, politicians, they come to Europe, they come to America to plead their case. And they are getting a lot of aid and support. But then they go home to the reality of daily warfare while the lives of people in America and Europe go on. And you, know, you can go to a quiet dinner in the safety of your home. But let me return to the Middle East to emphasize again that as things unravel, as Lebanon becomes engulfed in war and a regional conflagration looms on the horizon, the crux of the problem remains, as Baird said, the injustice of a decades-long occupation of the Palestinian territories. With every war, and even with every peace agreement, successive Israeli governments have tried to reshape the region and make peace with their neighbors while papering over the Palestinian question, canceling the Palestinians, building more settlements. At the UN, just last week at the General Assembly, we heard very strong words from the Jordanian Foreign Minister, Ayman Safadi. He said Netanyahu had just spoken, describing a Middle East where Israel is surrounded by enemies who want to destroy it. And Minister Safadi was not happy about that statement. And he answered that on behalf of 57 Arab and Muslim countries, he was stating unequivocally that all of us here are gathered and are willing to guarantee unequivocally the security of Israel in exchange for the emergence of a Palestinian state. He went on to say that if Israel rejected a Palestinian state, what was the end game? More wars, what is the strategy beyond the tactics of pager explosions? What is the strategy? I want to end with a few more thoughts on the West's responsibility in upholding some of the systems that hold back solutions in areas like the Middle East. It's often the timidity of political positions, the preference for the status quo. It's also driven by efforts to keep the problem far away rather than offering systemic solutions. A preference for short-term band-aid solutions, the necessity for coalition building, it takes a week to get a phone call, um, organized, but I want to give you a few examples of why sometimes we feel so frustrated in the region. In 2020, in August, August 4th, 2020, Lebanon was the site of one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in modern history when the Beirut port exploded. A lot of Lebanese blamed Hezbollah for that because they thought that Hezbollah had stored willingly or unwillingly, but, well, they had stored willingly explosive materials at the port. And they blamed the general, as we call it in Lebanon, mafia militia establishment, which collapsed the economy, is very corrupt, and of which Hezbollah is really a part of. They blamed that establishment for what was really a devastating explosion um, in Lebanon. And people took to the streets. And we thought that really after the... Uh, uprising of 2019 when people tried to bring down the system, but then COVID stopped it, we all had to go home. People thought that this was going to give another impetus to the effort to bring down the system and certainly try to address the issue of Hezbollah's stranglehold on Lebanese politics. President Emmanuel Macron came to Lebanon. And um, he came for a first visit to show, you know, support, uh, aid, etc. And then he came a second time. And he gathered all the leaders of the main establishment political parties. And he called for national 
unity. And when people said, but you know, how could you say this um, at this time? He said, well, you elected them. But then France, Europe comes and deals with the status quo, right? They are here, we deal with them. You Lebanese might want to have them removed, but this is not the time. It's too complicated. We don't want Lebanon to collapse, etc. And so the protests fizzled. People went home. And the system remained intact. In 2010, Saudi Arabia played a role in upholding that system as well. Uh, the Lebanese Prime Minister, Rafiq Hariri, assassinated in 2005. Hezbollah and Syria stand accused of being behind that. Syrian troops left Lebanon under popular uh, pressure. But by 2010, Saudi Arabia was seeking reconciliation with, with Syria. Rafiq Hariri was the beloved adopted son of Saudi Arabia, and the Saudis were very angry with, with, uh, with Syria and, uh, and Iran and Hezbollah for what had happened. But now they wanted reconciliation. And so, in essence, they asked Saad Hariri, the prime minister, the new prime minister, the son of Rafiq Hariri, to go to Damascus and reconcile with the man who'd killed his father. What can you do? And of course, for years in Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu did everything he could to undermine the creation of a Palestinian state to the extent that he made sure that Qatar continued to send millions of dollars to Hamas in Gaza right up until October 7th, just before October 7th, because he wanted to keep Hamas in power in Gaza and keep the Palestinians divided. And Qatar has received a lot of criticism for sending money to um, Hamas, but it was the Israelis who requested them to continue to do so. And all of this goes to the core issue of accountability and the impunity that we continue to see across the region, and which is becoming a worldwide issue, which is why I sit on the advisory council of the Atlas of Impunity to try to quantify what does that look like? Because impunity takes many forms, and it is not just a dictator in Syria killing his, um, his people. And then finally, briefly, on the issue of um, migration, because I know that's a hot topic in this region. But again, I want to just give you some examples of how the policies help to entrench the problems rather than to solve them. Because Europe is helping to entrench Arab autocrats by asking them to stop the flow of refugees from across the Mediterranean with no regard for their governance or human rights record, such as in Tunisia, which keeps getting more support and more aid. These autocrats, in turn, are then only too happy to pose as partners, claiming they alone can protect Europe's southern border from illegal immigrants in exchange, of course, for more cash. But it is the rule of these autocrats that is sending people across the Mediterranean to Europe, fleeing dictatorship at home. I have much criticism these days of the Biden administration, but I will quote Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, who recently said that our ability to treat other countries, not as proxy battlegrounds, but as partners, rests on our ability to bring something to that partnership. And I think those words, proxy battlegrounds versus partners, is a really good foundation to rethink how Europe approaches the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa, to see us not as a proxy battleground or as the further away border from which you can keep problems away from Europe, but as partners, including the people. You know, relying only on autocrats to preserve your interests does not actually serve your long interests, your long-term interests in Europe. Tomorrow, I will go back to Lebanon, inshallah.
I will land in a country very different than the one I left. I am deeply worried about the chaos that will be unleashed if the Israeli military campaign continues unabated. I am not religious in any way, but to conclude, I will quote one verse from the Bible, from the book of Habakkuk. The violence done unto Lebanon will overwhelm you. We need a ceasefire now. Thank you very much.